What is power? Quite frankly, I think most people have a good understanding of what power is, which is probably due to our familiarity with electrical and gas-powered machinery, along with like a horse-powered wagon, right? This is ultimately due to power being a scalar. Technically, power is the rate with, with respect to time at which work is done. It's the time der derivative of work. Power is the amount of energy transferred or converted per unit time. And in the SI unit system, the unit of power is the watt, so it's equal to one joule per second. And power is related to other quantities. For example, that power is involved in moving a ground vehicle. Uh, it's the, it's, that's like because of the, the friction, right? The traction is because of the friction force on the wheels and then the velocity of the vehicle. And this is all from Wikipedia. That the output of a motor is the product of the torque that the motor generates and the angular velocity of its output shaft. Likewise, the power dissipated in an electrical element of a circuit is the product of the current flowing through the element and of the voltage across the element. So essentially, power <laughs> is what it is. Right? That a horse can move a cart over a certain rate of time. And you can imagine that it would be important for a country or a king to standardize this genetic characteristic of a horse or a ox or any type of animal, to, to, or at least to try to minimize any type of variation right within this genetic characterization of the, a breed or a species of animal, as to select for favorable traits over time. So like a, a bull in Spain is, is known as a specific bull, like this black Brahma bull or Toro in general but so we can say right that there's as much of a race of bulls in spain as there is people right which in older times was probably helpful in figuring out the various the power of various dukedoms and kingdoms and stuff and all and then right everything in some think of kind of the doomsday book in england after the invasion by the normans it was just fine tooth combing of the english people and their potential power all the localities and specific specific uh, individuals and then in total in some power is also a rate in that it is the rate at which energy or work changes over time essentially we can define a new term here right uh, what is the derivative of power or the second derivative with respect to time of work which we can call relevance or some kind of locality of power or this kind of shift in a relativity a rel relevance of power in a specific locality right essentially how does power change over time which uh gets gets to the main point i want to make and that is of synchronicity right and sy synergy i'm not talking about a meme or a superstitious form of synchronicity it's a very real one that is understood and implemented daily across the globe everyone understands this we all know the term uh, we even know the term make the trains run on time. But how, how really does that affect power? Well, in America, our power output in reality is largely hindered by our lack of synchronicity due to the, well, it's due to the size of our country, among many other factors. Uh, for example, cities such as New York, uh, which is very dense, has subways, and the synchronicity is higher than, say, something like L.A., right, Los Angeles, or uh, even something like Atlanta, where everyone drives around in their own car. People commute to the city, and then they leave the city at night and go live in the suburbs. Uh, but So we can say that like something like Uber is going to improve synchronicity, especially when people begin to carpool and ride share. We see that synchronicity is related to the kind of a locality of power or the rate at which in some might be affected by local gradients within the power field in large or in general. So say, for instance, you have two cars in parallel at a red light, car one and car two. At the green light, the car on the left shoots out the gates. We will call that car one, while the car on the right progresses forward at a slower velocity, which we will call car two. Car 2 moves so much slower that an additional car on the left, which we will call car 3, is able to overtake car 2 on the right and pass in front of it. Eventually, cars 1 and 3 approach and reach the red light, 
while car two is driving so slow that it's still approaching the light, right? Still behind. So at the light, car three, which started in the left and now is at the right-hand lane, is going to take a right turn. It's going to take a right turn at the red light, while car one on the left has to stay put at the red light until it will turn green because it really accelerated off the red light before. So as it turns green, car three uh, is in the right lane. He's gone. He made the right. And the guy on the left is still, or car uh, one on the left is still stopped because he's at the red light. And then finally car two, or finally car two will make it to the green light. And then car one on the left will be stopped. And then car two will have a velocity because it will have not decelerated or stopped because it started slower. And in addition, it allowed car three to go to the right where it wanted. So there's this additional synchronicity or packing or mass transport phenomenon going on, right, <clears throat> due to the synchronicity. And plus, it used its resources more efficiently, car two, because it didn't have to do this extra deceleration and then the other acceleration that car one is going to do out of the red light because car one went too fast, right? But you could say that since it went fast, it allowed car three to have some synchronicity. But you can imagine that all these different kind of perspectives is what leads to all these different states when in reality if we this was all predetermined the synchronicity would be higher like a train <laughs> pack more people into uh, a mass transport this is the power synchronicity right the efficiency of a system can be improved through timing or more specifically timing periodic phenomena this can be understood through various analog phenomena in our physical world uh, the technical terms most are familiar with are relativity and relative velocities uh, a classic example is a train leaving a station in city X and going certain speed and direction, and then that train will be intersected by another train coming from a perpendicular or angled direction from city Y or something, and then it might be a third train from city Z. So the hypothetical collision or, or not is depending on the speed and timing of the whole experiment. And, and then when we do these problems or we think about it, we assume that everything is kind of perfect, right? That the clocks, <laughs> the clocks are the same in cities X, Y, and Z. But for example, uh, with the, the example, the the previous example with the two and the two or three cars, and the best synchronization of their movements, well, that is relative to each perspective of time. Perhaps uh, car one's clock is in there is running fast, and they think they're late. And, and because of that, they zoom up, right? And then maybe it's not all good. They cause an accident because they're rushing or vice versa. Or vice versa, there, there's another uh, perspective that their clock is running slow. So they think they can lolly, lollygag and then the person behind them is going to be late to work. Um, and an, an obvious solution to increase the power or relevant power of a sector of a city or state is to control the arrangement or to pack the particles as close together as to make a whole in a mass trans transport uh, situation or a kind of phenomenon, right? A bus or train will move people faster through a street than just cars, which are going to be bumping into each other as they turn individually. Uh, just from a perspective of moving people through a set length, uh, a set length over time, right? It's going to be like a tube of fluid or a pipe or even kind of like a rotor at the end of a turbine that turns the shaft and produces energy or power, right? There's going to be a power or a scale to it that we can go high or low and then obviously if you are into mass transport you'd want to be high you want to be able to transport as much mass as possible without as much chaos or interruption so along a pipe or or, <clears throat> or even like a flowing stream there is going to be some pressure gradients and the flow is going to be smooth or turbulent depending on the obstructions and such uh, we can imagine a smooth pipe will not have many obstructions or corrugated surfaces that have uh, or like a rough surface uh, so a, a corrugated surface is, is going to have lots of nooks and crannies for water to w rub up against but also kind of channel into uh, we can imagine the water mo molecules going into the dry nooks and channels of a cro corrugated surface or like a corroded surface and or maybe like so if if the pipe is dry at first, it's going to flow the water, right? And it's eventually going to flow down the length of the pipe. But the pipe itself is going to be dry at first. So some of these channels are going to be dry. So then you could imagine some of them 
you can imagine like if it's like low tide, a, t a cave, right? It's not going to be filled up with the ocean water, but then eventually the water's going to come back in. Uh, but there's probably going to also be some kind of other phenomena where we can imagine the water molecules um, have some kind of surface tension, right? And then maybe there's a vacuum formed around some of these channels until you get enough pressure from the bulk fluid or bulk flow of the fluid in the pipe that you are able to break through these surface tensions on the the out, outside of these like caves or channels on the on the inside of the pipe. So once you break through that surface tension, you have enough pressure, the water begins to flow into these what were dry kind of like uh, channels. As a result, water flows into the dry channels and the pressure behind the liquid changes because the movement of the molecule creates a void or a lower pressure area that needs to be filled, right? If you put one molecule into the channel, then it needs to be replaced behind it, right? And that's how you get these pressure gradients. We can envision how chaotic that can be. We might think of a busy street in New York City back in the day when you could park anywhere and trucks could unload on the street anywhere and tourists and buses and limos and taxis would be stopping and going. But nevertheless, the flow can be calculated just from this kind of control volume analysis of inlet minus outlet is uh, gen equals generation minus consumption. So doing this, we'll find that a train or subway will have an improved flow, right? A subway that runs on time and has convenient routes will move more people through sp space and time than roads. This is due to the arrangement and timing being predetermined. So a lot of in-between phases and components within phases or species or, or okay so let me say this again this is due to the arrangement and timing being predetermined so a lot of in between species and components within phases of the bulk materials are caught out so a smooth pipe versus a corroded pipe basically if we measure the pressure drop or head loss across both pipes the one with smooth insides will have the smaller pressure drop or smallest head loss as opposed to the rough pipe the smoothness will give the best synchronicity or relevance because well what use is a shower <laughs> with no pressure? And obviously the other extreme exists too. You don't want to shower with too much pressure and it blows you against the wall or something when you turn it on. Thinking, so think of more about this. A faucet, or in general any water valve, can be rotated. So there's a frequency there that's going to be neat, that need to be synchronized with your expected need. Right, so the, the earth rotates and then it rotates around the sun. So we have days and nights. And then we also have winter and summer and all in between. So our, <laughs> our use of hot water and other uh, when we need the water is going to be f uh, dependent on that kind of rotation. And the valve itself rotates, right? So there's a lot of frequencies and stuff. And then we can be in between phases and stuff. Again, what use is a shower without pressure, but also what use is a shower with no hot water, right? Especially in the middle of, of winter. Moving ahead to internal energy. We can imagine a car will have an internal energy of its own. We can imagine many different types of oscillations in spaces or planes with respect to time. <clears throat> so relating to chemistry, depending on the molecule, you can have all types of symmetries and oscillations, both apl applicable to the whole structure while others more localized or transient. Um, uh, so, you know, sometimes... You can have specific or local uh, oscillations, and it's like, right, we can imagine that we can bend our knee, but our whole body doesn't necessarily move or bend because of that, whereas we can jump up and down, and because of that, our whole body is being translated. <clears throat> Internal energy, and, 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 and specific, is vibrational, rotational, and translational energy of a molecule. So when you're driving to work, during the summer, as opposed to winter, there will be some oscillations, right? Or you might take wider angles as you turn in the winter, right? Because, well, because it's snowing. So you might leave earlier for work sometimes, uh, sometimes during the year to avoid the sun. You might have a, a glare, or you might not have any glare because your commute is north to south. Maybe you'll look at the road ahead of you at higher frequencies in the winter during a storm, right? So you can imagine there's going to be some oscillation that said we can imagine the internal energy well it's gonna be hard to measure so it's always kind of hard to measure the internal energy itself can be transient or time dependent so again you could have a specious phase within larger kind of racial uh, uh, bulk materials 
if you, if you drive during busy times, you won't go as far over the same period. You'll be stuck in traffic, right? If a, or if like a location has easier access to parking somewhere, you'll be more likely to stop there. Location does matter. Or if you have really, or if you're like really hungry, <laughs> or it's a, or something, or you're like in, a, you have a necessity, you'll probably go and park wherever, right? It won't really matter. I'd like to. <clears throat> Take this analogy further by way of a scientific study. So from physical chemistry, chemical physics, uh, 2006, the title, is inf the title of the, the article is Influence of Internal Energy and Impact Angle on the Sticking Behavior of Reactive Radicals in, in uh, Thin uh, Film Growth. Uh, it's a molecular and dynamic study. So the study looked at the ability to grow thin films of car carbon chain molecules with respect to changes in the internal energy and also how the impact angle affected the film growth. They call the ability uh, for a carbon chain to form a bond and add to the films. Uh, they call that sticking. So we can imagine stickiness <laughs> as we as the ability to stick. And we can all think of how that works. Um so, it, yeah, it might be a little counterintuitive, but imagine a street and cars or just transport phenomena in general when thinking about this paper and the title. First of all, that sticking or the ability to grow film is all the very synchronized parts and ways to go about the street with ease. And the ability to not grow film is all the unsynchronized or out-of-phase movements that would be produced, right? W well, we can imagine a crystal is very synchronized, right? When watches, <laughs> their timing is dependent on the crystal lattice structure of quartz and such, right? That uh, uh, crystalline structure is <laughs> very synchronized, right? Uh, so let's read, uh, let's read from the results, and I'll explain some more. The results. The relevance of these effects become clear by com comparison with C2H. The sticking coefficient of C2H is considerably lower than the sticking, co sticking coefficient of C2. And it's also much more dependent on the internal energy, varying from nearly 0.8 to about 0.5 for an internal energy between 0.026 and 2.6 uh, EVs, respectively. Indeed, while in C2 both C atoms can react with the surface, the C2H radical will stick to the surface virtually always with the C atom that is not carrying the H atom. The other C atom is shielded by the H atom. Hence, in this case, the orientation of the radical relative to the surface is limiting, it, limiting its reaction probability, increasing the internal energy, and hence introducing more violent vibrations results in a decrease in the sticking coefficient. Indeed, since the H atom is very light, it moves much faster than the C atoms. Increasing the internal energy allows the H atom to cover a wider area around the C atom it is attached to. When the radical now approaches the surface, the repulsive forces between the radical and the surface atoms will become more apparent due to the wider action radius of the H atom. In other words, the H atom that partially shields the radical from the surface widens its repulsive interaction range within the surface to do its amplified motion, resulting from the increase in internal energy. <laughs> so all that said, it's, when it's raining, you have your windshield wipers on because you obviously can't see as good without them. Furthermore, there are notches or frequency levels within the blade mechanism, mechanisms themselves. Right, We can turn the blades up higher and lower, more frequent and less frequent. But nevertheless, the use of the wipers implies the weather is not ideal. So as an analogy, a C2H molecule has its wipers on. The H molecules, is, it's the wipers are on. Whereas a C2 does not. So the C2H reduces its reaction probability that there's a transient period or time <laughs> where you're kind of out of phases. The windshield is not transparent or you just don't trust the road, right? There's a, you have a, you're, and your head's already baked in that the, you know when it rains that the road is going to be slippery. So you don't, you, you don't drive as fast, and uh, you take wider turns, right? They turn into a park a lot. If you you don't turn into a parking lot at a sharp turn during a sh snowstorm, right? Because <laughs> you might slip. You'll slow down, which the experiments suggest. And when it's raining, you might not see people. Uh, you, well, you're going to see people probably more, more likely you're going to see crashes, right? These high, these kind of... Uh, these violent <laughs> collisions, right? And they're going to have severe consequences. 
You can imagine if you had two hands-free uh, driving as opposed to one, you'd see the same effects as those saw concluded in the paper, right, with the CH as opposed to C2. Or we can imagine that the, there's an imbalance that is shielding or causing some kind of out-of-phase behavior periodically during a drive or anything in general, right? I mean, just take that example in general. You don't have to just think of it as a car. It's just one helpful way to look at it. So reading further, the, the I, C3 radical, is similar to C2 in the sense that it has two C atoms which can freely react with the surface. The middle C atom, which is fully bound, almost never reacts with the surface. Hence, the reaction probability of C3 is nearly independent of its rotational orientation relative to the surface, similar to C2. In contrast to C2, however, the sticking coefficient of IC3 shows an additional append dependence on its internal energy. A higher internal energy increases the number of sticking events with one of the outer C a a uh, atoms due to the lower influence of the middle C atom. As the molecule vibrates more, the radical is more nonlinear, decreasing the repulsive interaction from the middle C atom uh, with the surface. We can imagine that if you eat before you leave or get gas before you leave or fulfill some task before a round trip, then you won't be as tempted to stop uh, somewhere, even something har as harmless as shopping. But we can imagine, as the study suggests, if the round trip is long, uh, the two ends of a vibration, right, that you're kind of stretched out, you might not, you might, or sorry, you might stop for a bite or to, to grab something so you don't have to go out later, uh, right? You might stop to get something before you head in for the night, right? We can also imagine a three-lane road, right? So that you, there's a, right, where the two lane, the two, two outer lanes have an exit route, whereas the middle lane has to go forward and is at the will of the lanes on either side. It's basically, it's, it's illegal to switch two lanes. Vice versa, uh, that location matters for a business, right? The in entrance or exit can be blocked, and it won't matter if the inside or the store offers the same goods because there's going to be no convenience for drivers. And worse, like worse that they could be dangerous in intersections uh, or if – some places they they like you can only take a right out of there, so then you got to go to the light and f take a U turn or something. It's a pain in the you know what, or it just might be that it's dangerous, right? <laughs> Some locations are dangerous to get out of, or just more in general they're just dangerous, so people don't go there. Uh, if you fly in a plane, most people will prefer the aisle over the middle seat, as you will be locked into that position and have less internal energy or ability to move about. We can see that there's a specific specificity to the position, specifically the middle position, <laughs> which doesn't allow for many synchronizations of the other two seats. Uh, going further, a business should look for ideal synchronicity with transportation nodes and, hu and hubs. For example, if, if there's a place <clears throat> for shopping or to get food in, in like an airport, people will find it convenient and spend money at these locations. If the orientation doesn't matter, and if you increase internal energy, we could imagine that people would eat in between long flights. If the oscillations or translations are long enough in between, you have, say you have a layover or you're flying across the country, you might grab that bite to eat, right, if you have the chance. The same is true, so let's read further. The same is true for the IC3H radical, although here the effect is reduced by the effect of the increased H interaction. Overall, the H atom is responsible for the lower sticking coefficient of I IC3H as compared to IC3. The CC3 and CC3H radicals are species with weak interatomic bonds due to their structure. Indeed, the three atom ring configuration introduces, introduces a ring stress, lowering the interatomic bond strengths. Upon impact, most of these radicals break up, as shown in Figure 4. Here, the fraction of the radicals that break up upon impact and subsequently stick on the surface is depicted. In this process, the radicals are converted into their respective linear counterparts. The calculated sticking coefficients for these species of high internal energies therefore correspond very closely to the value obtained for the linear species. Uh, again, we can understand the effect of the hydrogen atom on C, C, 3, H, as if you're driving with your wipers on. If it's, if it's raining on the way home or if the trip 
or maybe even the trip home is shorter or maybe you have dinner already cooked or leftovers and you just need to heat it up you may not be as likely to stop in between or somewhere along the line of a round trip uh, and then going further at lower internal energies the calculated sticking coefficients are higher for the cyclic isomers compared to the linear isomers this is caused by the reactivity of the unpaired electrons and the cyclic radicals in the absence of a fully balanced central atom in the cyclic isomers. Therefore, the radicals can easily interact with the surface, leading to a high sticking coefficient. As the internal energy increases, more radicals are converted into their linear counterparts due to the increase in the breakup events. In a fully bound central, a uh, C atom is created, altering the sticking coefficient coefficient such that it converges towards the value for the corresponding linear radical. So the paper concludes cyclic isomers stick better than a linear one. So you can imagine if you went to the mall <laughs> and you just walked down one side or you just drove down one side of the street, right? Uh, and then you went and then you turn around, right? And you went back the same way. You would not buy the same amount of stuff or the probability that you would just that you would go to every store or ever stop anywhere on the other side is practically zero, right? <laughs> just because you won't go to that side and it's this fact that it's linear. But on the other hand, if you, you would have a chance of visiting every store or just stopping anywhere if you were, were to go in this kind of circle around the mall, right, or <laughs> town. Uh, the same reason why casinos are not easy to get from one to end to the other, right? Casinos are not like any other place. They don't allow you like a, a linear path anywhere. It's all obstructed and uh, you had to go in circular. You had to go around stuff, right? <laughs> Ask somebody how do you how do you get to the, the elevators from the from the check-in lobby? They're gonna say you got to go around this, go there, and go around here. <laughs> they want you to stick around and gamble, right? <laughs> Same reason a plane doesn't just shuttle back and forth between two cities, but most likely goes in a circuit or some kind of round trip among many cities. And then there's going to be a hub at the center geographically of all the flight plans. And there could be minor or special, special or regional hubs for smaller routes. Also, we can imagine if you go around an object enough that you would want to put something in the middle of importance to the node. So maybe we can imagine that for a certain intersection, it might make sense to put a roundabout to reduce speed and collisions while improving the throughput. In the middle of a school, it might be good to put a cafeteria <laughs> or a food court in the mall. So reading further. At medium, hyperthermal, hyperthermal impact en energies 10 to 100 EVs, the sticking behavior of, of impacting particles is strongly dependent on the impact angle, just drastically lowering the sticking, sticking coefficient and leading to a greater scattering as the impact angle increases as demonstrated. In example, references 40 to 42. Here we have also investigated the effect of the impact angle in the range between 0 to 45 degrees on the sticking coefficient of different radicals. Recall, however, that the incident energy of the radicals is only 0.13 EVs. And the results are shown in figure 5. It appears that the effect is minimal for all species. Furthermore, the reaction mechanism for the different species remains unaltered when changing the impact angle. Hence, the effects described above remain valid under these circumstances. Possibly, this is due to the low kinetic energy of the species. Indeed, at low impact energies, the incoming radical has enough time to interact with the surface irrespective of the impact angle, since the interaction time between the radical and the surface hardly changes with the impact angle. Hence, it appears that the assumption of normal incidence in uh, MD simulations of bombarding species with low incident energies can give a realistic picture, even if the exact impact angle is not known. So the, the effects of impact angle on stickiness could be due to the fact that at higher internal energies and large, uh, large angles increases, the area of the probability of reaction also will, uh, will decrease, right? So you won't have as much time to react, basically. In general terms, you don't <laughs> react as fast. So if you don't have the increased angle or or gradient or degree of separation you won't need to right you won't need to react there's no need for it because it doesn't exist <laughs> right so they didn't shoot particles basically uh, at fast enough to even understand that right so they just assume basically <laughs> that's that there was just enough time right for 
for it to, to react, even irrespective of the angle. But if you start to shoot it at, at it quickly, you might not have as much time. So that's basically what it's saying, right? That it's just you, there was no need because it didn't exist. So maybe like when you bring your umbrella, but it doesn't rain, right? But if it does rain, th that you're going to kind of unfold it, right? And the more unfolded you make the umbrella, the weaker and further the harder it's raining. Much to say that there's kind of gradients or species within phases. We need to be specific with that gradient. Uh, when we want, we want within a phase for it's like so you have raining and non-raining days. For our non-raining day, we'll have the umbrella folded, buttoned, and in a compressed position. And then vice versa, when it's raining, depending on the rain, we open it a certain amount. And more generally, uh, an umbrella is only for the rain, and we only bring it in those specific times. So, a good analogy we can work with to describe this is a radial or axial tur turbine, as well as a sailboat. Both are going to use a flow like the wind or the water and position themselves as to impart the power from the motion of the molecules into the body that rests or interacts with the moving medium. The wind doesn't seem like it has power, but there is an internal energy and in that there are molecules moving around in the air even if we can't see them. A helpful way to understand the phase and gradient dependency for these mechanisms is to consider a turbine or sailboat again. A sailboat uses a sail and a keel in tandem to produce a forward motion. Without a rudder or a keel, the boat would just rotate one way or the other, right? It might just tip over or it might just spin in circles. An easy way for all to experience the balancing act that causes either a rotation force uh, in a rotor or the propelling fo force in a sailboat is to take a spoon and then <laughs> hold it underneath the faucet, right? We all understand this. Uh, that the more you rotate the faucet, the more flow comes out, right? the more water comes out. And also the higher you hold the spoon in relation to the, to the opening of the faucet, the gravity will have a higher potential. Right? So if you lower the spoon relative to the, uh, the opening of the faucet, it's going to have a, a more force or you're going to feel it more because it's going to have more of the gravity potential imparted into it. It's going to have accelerated over that time. And, and right and thus affect the rotation of the spoon. Uh, we also know the um, <clears throat> that if we start moving the spoon around, it's going to react different di differently to the flow based on the orientation. Right, it's going to be like an oar in the water or like a shovel spade in the ground. And this also depends on the consistency or the viscosity of the medium medium being parted. But for but for general sake, we can discuss known material. Right, people have a good feel for intuitively, like water coming out of the faucet. And how it interacts with metal or something. That also, like in w in winter, it's harder to dig in the ground, right? So you might have to angle the shovel straight up and then step on it, as opposed to kind of this more tangential uh, uh, angle to the ground during like the summer or something, or the spring when it's mo nice and moist. Another way to describe this is that uh, for a cake, we can spread the icing around uh, the cake really good, right? We can make it really smooth, but when we begin cutting through it. Well, you're going to always mess up the center, right? When you cut through a cake, these kind of uh, radial uh, cuts to make slices out of it, it's going to get messy. And it's because of the viscosity of the icing or the fruit filling and the direction of the shear and the force. And then whereas like an avocado, it has a solid pit. So we can go tangential to that and really get good slices or we can really just like get it clean, right? We can just really get all of it out of there. And it's going to be more efficient. Whereas we can imagine going radial or <laughs> axial would be less efficient and probably cause structural damage to the knife, right? Eventually, you're going to dull the blade over time uh, more uh, quicker as relative to whereas you, if you were to go tangential, right? That would reduce the wear and increase efficiency. For a turbine, there's a guiding vein to guide the flow into the turbine runners, whereas the turbine runners are what are going to rotate and, and provide the generation of power. The vein guides are there to turn the water into something useful because because without it, it would just be this chaotic free-for-all mess that would be of no economic or practical value for producing power. The guiding vein is like the faucet handle in the two, right? That can be used to guide the flow and the rate. In a sailboat, if we draw out the force, so we literally draw it with hand, <laughs> not draw out like a extrusion, but the force that acts on the sail 
we can assume a conservation of momentum. Always conservation of momentum. Whatever. Just that's just like the go-to answer for anything. It says a force over an area uh, will produce a pressure normal to that surface, right? So if you, you, uh, if you, the wind hits the sail, and it's gonna make this normal pressure on the other side, right? So airfoil works because of the lift caused by the high pressure pushing lower pressure back, or the high pressure air flowing into low pressure regions. The high pressure is caused because it's easier to go down the graded side of an airfoil as opposed to over the steep side, which causes the air to flow faster over the top and thus decrease the pressure on the top as relative to the, on the bottom, right? Because on the bottom, the, 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 the molecules are moving slower, so they're going to build up, right? There's going to be a greater pressure. It's going to be, we can imagine, think of being in a slow-moving line, right? The slow-moving line is going to build up, and then there was maybe kind of a, a fast moving line but it was kind of farther away right it was on the other end of the superstore you're in well so you might move to that line if you say you can move quicker right because if you if you don't move quick enough then your spot's going to be taken right <laughs> because there's enough pressure in that line you're in that if you move and you don't move quick enough to that other line well then your your spot is gone right or and just in general we can imagine that's how pressure would work right from high pressure to low pressure regions uh, we can imagine it even better, like when you're in the grocery store, a new checkout line might open. And then that new open line is going to fill quickly from these other more backed up lines. And, then, and, you know, when people are given the opportunity to upgrade to first class for free, right? They usually, they usually don't turn that down. Going back to airfoils and lift, assuming a flat or rigid sail, the force from the pressure of the wind on the sail will be in the normal direction as like shown. So for the... For the so for the most basic movements, like a sailboat directly into the wind and then directly against it uh, with the keel parallel to the wind, we are limited to just a, adjusting the angle of the sail, right? We're not going to adjust the keel or the angle of the boat. We're just going to adjust the angle of the sail. So for this setup, there will be two phases, an alpha and a beta phase that correspond to the angle created by the force normal to the area of the sail. When the boat is going with the wind, we see that as we increase the alpha phase or gradient of alpha with respect to angular rotation, that the keel direction of the force is greater than the tangential or drag component of, this, of the sail. So we can imagine that there's two components. There's the direction of the keel, and then there's the direction of the drag or the tangential direction. If we increase the beta gradient, the force will be comprised more of the tangential component as opposed to the keel force which isn't good. Ideal, ideally, you want, the, you want to have the force being comprised of the keel component as much as possible. So you want this tangential angle to matter when grading or angling the sail. Against the wind, it is just the opposite. Increasing beta gradient or phase will cause a greater component of force in the keel direction. Now, of course, we can also change the direction of the boat or which way the keel is facing. You don't necessarily have to have it angled so as to be parallel with or against the direction of the wind. We can angle it along with the sail as to maximize or increase the direction of the keel in the same direction that that captain intends to go. If you have good winds at your back, well, you can sail faster than the wind. And I mean, you could even snake or what they call tacking or what is going to be essentially sailing into the wind. You can sail into the wind. With the added lever, you will have at least two more gradients or phases, which, will, which we will call delta and gamma, or these delta and gamma species, where delta and gamma, again, are subspecies or species of either the alpha or beta phases mentioned in the previous example. Nevertheless, the analysis is straight, as straightforward as before. The sail collects the wind, and the force acts normal to the sail. We can imagine at a certain angle that the wind will switch from blowing on one side to blowing on the other, right? That at some point that <clears throat> that the wind it that the wind is gonna just flip over, right? We can imagine that angle. We can construct parallel perspectives or angle two pairs of axis in such a way as to describe the relative motions of the wind, keel, and sail that result in the force of the boat moving in a direction. We can assume the keel and the drag axis of the sail will always form a 90 degree pair. That the keel and then the tangential form or the tangential component will always form a 90 degree pair. And likewise, we can imagine south and north along with east and west will form axes as well. 
before drawing the force, we can see that we will always have that. No, sorry. Before drawing the force, we will see that we will have alpha and beta phases as such. And when we position the sail, we create the delta and gra gamma gradients or species within the beta or alpha phases. And this is going to be depending on the direction of the keel and sail with respect to the wind or the cardinal directions. So if we, if we position east against the wind, we will get gamma and delta gradients within the beta phase, which won't be apparent in the mirrored beta phase of the westerly direction of axis or axis direction. Uh, so evalu evaluating this, this type of setup uh, using trigonometry in some linear algebra, uh, we can write all the following equations or mass balances that we know alpha plus beta equals 90 degrees and depending on the setup of the sail that delta plus gamma plus either alpha or beta will also equal 90 degrees or we can define another gradient or term lambda which can either be delta plus alpha or delta plus beta because remember when we when we when we start off we just have alpha and beta and then when we move the sail we create the the delta and gamma subspecies within alpha or beta and it depends whether it's in alpha or beta so and then to make it easier we can just say that it's uh, lambda right that lambda is alpha plus beta or alpha plus delta or beta plus delta and again this depends on the direction of the sail it's dependent on the sail position lambda will either be comprised of alpha plus delta or beta plus delta all together we get tangent of lambda and then all t and then of course, we have the linear algebra, or the mass balances, to kind of relate all these. When analyzing using the trigonometry, tangent of gamma is what we'll call T over K, where T is the tangential or drag component of the force, and K is the keel component of the force. That said, a more helpful form is tangent of lambda, right, where the tangent of lambda equals K over T. This allows us to reach the same conclusions as before by just taking limits of this equation. Or you could even just play around with the angles by subbing in real values. As gamma increases, the lambda regime will become less tangent and the keel component will increase. Reversing the direction of the wind will give us the equation of the form that tangent of gamma equals k over t. So as the gamma gradient or species increases, we see the decrease of the beta phase and increase overall of the alpha phase. But we shouldn't get too bogged down in the trigonometry uh, for these like qualitative examples, right? Alpha, gamma, beta are just these rel are just terms that can be replaced with with whatever is specific to your physical uh, mechanism or phenomena being observed. You draw the axis and then you can label whatever you want, right? Say east is like cheap and west is expensive, and north is profitable, and south is a loss. And then think of the ship as like your project, right, that you can begin modeling, right, where you want to go. You probably want to end up making profit, but you probably want to do it kind of in the cheapest way possible, but that might not always be so because there might be a wind against you. Sometimes you have the wind in your sail. Sometimes you don't, right? And sometimes the land, there might be land here or on the east side or the west side, right? I mean, this is all part of the model and how we make sense of it, but... A ship itself is good because it has two levers and it's a very simple kind of uh, setup. Um, just make it simple, right? That we can imagine if we had, if we quit our job <laughs> and, then, and then you took up an expensive habit in the same day, <laughs> this would be a bad synchronization. Uh, just generally, there would be phases associated with it that could be described through gradients, and that it could be, it could be even more complicated than that too. We could have, we could, we could get fire, and then we say as we try to find a job. We gradually like pick up a habit or something, right? And then maybe that it turns over. There's like an inflection point, and, that, and things turn around or something. Looking at the equation in terms of the internal energy, we see that K or the keel component can be written as a differential, or dK equals dT tangent of the angle gamma, right? So we just basically uh, t you have K over T equals uh, tangent of gamma, right? So you just times tangent of gamma by t, right? And then you're left with k, and then we say, oh, we'll make a differential of this. So recall, depending on the wind, we can also write dt lambda. So depending again on the wind, um, 
Looking at the form of the equation, one might think it looks like the internal energy calculation of uh, liquids and solids, right? That delta U equals CV delta T, or where delta T is the temperature. And then going back to the original form of the equation, uh, tan, tangent of gamma equals K over T, and tangent of lambda equals K over T, depending on the wind. We see that they they are right that they're in opposite directions. As gamma gets bigger, lambda is smaller. We can imagine a crosswind or taking these as partials of a total derivation of the wind felt by the sail. We might have a northwest wind and a faint south breeze. So overall, we'll feel this kind of relative wind or velocity, which is a result or a sum of these vector components of each direction, north, south, east, and west. When going against the wind to increase the k component, we have to increase the delta and alpha. Because remember that lambda equals alpha or beta plus delta. So as we increase the delta phase or gradient, uh, so as we increase the delta species or gradient, the keel component becomes more tangible. We can think when we we can imagine when we drive in the snow, we might try to drive more tangent to curves as we fear sharp turns, much like against the wind. You want to reduce the drag and turn the wind into a tangible thing, not a wasteful or less efficient thing. Conversely, conversely, when going with the wind, tangent gamma describes the change of the keel direction of the force over the drag component. All in all, the cyclic or rotational aspect to the movement or position of the sail allows for more potential movements and thus will be stickier with an increased internal energy. Right. So going back to the study, that a cyclic chain is stickier than this C3 or linear chain because of the middle paired C in the C3. So if your sail only had this linear translation, you could only have a 90 uh, degree rotation or none at all, right? So that the sail is either going to be on the right side or the left side at uh, the zero, uh, zero degrees with respect to the, the east and west horizon, right? So you can't angle the sail. Well, then that's kind of like this linear chain. Whereas if you could, you have a cyclic, a cyclic is more continuous about the axis rotation with potentially 360 degrees of potential sail positions. We can imagine the same for a roundabout in a uh, busy intersection, right? That roundabouts are safer and allow for more st stickiness or potential synchronizations as opposed to sharp turns and stop signs where people are not going <laughs> to take a sharp turn. If they do, they're going to end up in these violent vibrations or collisions, um, it, right? It's going to tend to cause less synchronization and more accidents. You could argue that th that would mean more synchronization, but I say not so, as over time it will evolve to where eventually the road will be changed or a roundabout will be added or some other kind of safe exit is going to be made or changed, right? A couple people have to die for a stop sign to become a red light, basically. Uh, more specifically, we can create a gradient that models, uh, you know, a turn with stop sign as being harder, right? We can say that maybe we'll model it that turning left out of the stop sign is more dangerous as opposed to right, and then at night even more so, right? That's that said, you can imagine the embedding phases and species within that that could form, right? That help kind of crystallize these situations or make up the model itself, the kind of inner working of the model. That a big hill on a cold wintry day will be a bad synchronization. And most people's perspective is the same as well. So people won't go down that hill. But maybe they'll go down, go to a more graduated or circular pathway down the hill, feeling, feeling essentially more stuck to the ground at that particular time and place. 